नमस्कार सुस्वागतम केम छो आदाबाज वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून आप सभी का टी आर एल के अमृत व्याख्यान में स्वागत है अभिनंदन है ए वेरी वॉम वेलकम फ्रॉम मी अनिल भारद्वाज फॉर द पी आर एल का अमृत व्याख्यान टुडे इज द फिफ्टी एर्थ व्याख्यान ऑफ द सेवेंटी फाइव एपिसोड सीरीज ऑफ व्याख्यान विच इज बींग ऑर्गेनाइज as a part of prs 75 years of legacy and history in fundamental physics and space sciences established in the year 1947 by the father of indian space program dr vikram sarabhai the prs platinum jubilee coincides with india's 75 years of independence hence it's a joint celebration of the development of science and technology in india by prl under the banner of prl ka amrit vyakhyan today we have yet another very distinguished vyakhyan karta with us dr shailesh nayak who is currently the director of national institute of advanced studies in bengal not only he is the director of this institute he has wore many more hats which my colleague will be providing you the details when he introduce the speaker we greatly appreciate and thank Dr. Shailesh Nayak, for accepting our invitation and to be with us today in the PRL Kamrit Vyakhyan, which is a part of PRL's Platinum Jubilee celebration, as well as of Ajadi Kamrit Mahotsav. I now request my colleague, Professor Pallam Raju, to kindly introduce our today's Vyakhyan Karta, Dr. Shailesh Nayak, to the WebEx panel, as well as those who have joined us live on the PRL's YouTube channel. over to you professor pallam raju thank you professor bharadwaj and it's indeed a great pleasure and honor for me to introduce uh, today's distinguished uh, speaker dr uh, shailesh uh, nayak he is uh, currently the director of the national institute of advanced studies in bengaluru and also he is the chancellor of the terry school of advanced studies and editor in chief of the journal of indian society of remote sensing He obtained his uh, PhD degree from uh, uh, MS University Baroda in geology in 1980. He was uh, well, he worked as distinguished scientist in the Ministry of Earth Sciences. He was a president of the Inter International Geological Congress during 2015 to 2017. He was the secretary of the Ministry of Earth Sciences, Government of India during 2008 to 2015. and uh, under his leadership uh, several programs were related to the earth system sciences were initiated he has been credited with launching of many research programs uh, related to monsoon air sea interaction changing water cycle atmospheric chemistry coastal vulnerability climate services and polar sciences among others he had set up hpc system having 1.1 petaflops capacity for weather and climate research and operations he had uh, restructured meteorological activities in the country and thus improved weather and hazard related uh, services he had set up state of the art uh, tsunami warning system in the indian ocean in 2007 and in, in just two years time uh, which is providing tsunami advan uh, advisories to the indian ocean rim countries he pioneered in the development of algorithms and methodologies for applications of remote sensing of uh, coastal and marine environ environment and generated baseline database of the indian coast and developed services for fishery and ocean state uh, forecast the generation of uh, detailed information of the indian coast has influenced the development of policy for zoning of coastal zone and regulated coastal activities he is a fellow of all the three academies in india in addition he is a fellow of the indian uh, international society of photogrammetry and remote sensing and academician of the international academy of astronautics in paris he has been awarded uh, honorary distinguished uh, degrees uh, of doctor of sciences from andhra university in, in 2011 assam university in 2013 and amity university in 2015 He was conferred with prestigious ISC Vikram Sarabhai Memorial Award in 2012, Bhaskara Award in 2009, uh, Harinarayan Lifetime Achievement Award in 2013, RC Mishra Lifetime Award in 2020, and Lifetime Geospatial Leadership Award in 
for his outstanding contributions in remote sensing and GIS. He has published around 200 papers in peer-reviewed uh, scientific journals. Uh, with this uh, brief introduction, it is a great honor and a pleasure for me to invite Dr. Shailesh Nayak uh, to please uh, uh, talk, give his Vyakhyam, 50th uh, Vyakhyam on Ocean Sciences to Blue Economy. Professor Nayak, please. <clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pallav Raju, and uh, I'm extremely grateful to Dr. Bharadwaj for inviting me and giving this uh, opportunity to talk to you about this. And it's really uh, my great honor bestowed by you all is, I really appreciate. And uh, my greetings to all of you also on the Platinum Jubilee year, and of course, uh, India's uh, Azadi Mahotsav. So what I thought is that uh, the currently you may not, uh, you may all be hearing about a lot of about the blue economy, but how this has come, how this uh, idea of uh, utilizing the knowledge which we have generated over the last several years or several decades has now been translated or how being monetized in for the benefit of the society and the country. Now, why ocean is very important? One very important thing is the life originated in ocean. That is the one very important reason that why ocean is going to support us in all times to come. It also controls weather and climate. It provides food, energy and resources. So the whole ecosystem, which because of the ocean, the earth becomes habitable. And the various assets which we have on the marine and the coastal environment, which provides essential infrastructure. Now, this has been recognized by UN and the Sustainable Development Goals 14 very clearly mentioned that we need to conserve and sustainably use the resources which is provided by oceans. So this aspect, if you can see the all 17 uh, sustainable development goals, the focus is on the ocean. And that is very important for our coming uh, decades in view of the resources crunch on the land because of the climate change and many other issues. We need to depend more and more on the ocean in coming years. And that is why also this decade, the 21 to 2030, has been declared by UN as a decade of the ocean science for sustainable development. Basically, it provides a framework so that how the, each country can achieve the 2030 agenda for the sustainable development, keeping basically ocean into the focus. Now, what should be our agenda? There are many things uh, which we need to do to bring the sustainable ecosystem. But I have tried to do uh, very briefly, which these four aspects, if you have to do, there are many things which we need to do uh, to bring this. The first is we need to build ecosystem-based models because there are competing demands for the development and there are demands for conservation of the ecosystem. Now, how do we balance this both so that the livelihood is not affected at the same time, the ecosystem is also preserved. Now, if you look back in 1972, the Stockholm Conference, which basically set the agenda for the protecting the environment. But after 50 years, recently now, again, this after 50 years, when the assessment has been taken place, it realized that unless you develop the socioeconomic conditions of the people, unless you provide livelihood, the environment aspect is not going to be addressed. So both has to go in hand in hand. So it is very important that we also build a socioeconomic models to assess the impact of the activities and how both can survive. So these are the two main 
uh, issues. Now, if we have to do this, the education at all levels, at uh, regional level, national level, institutional level, at the individual level, is very important that how we impart the education about the ocean and sustainability to the all concern. And this knowledge which we generate, how it can be distributed to the different stakeholders in the maritime and many other fields. So this should be our major goal for the next 10 years or so. Now, when we come to the blue economy, it is essentially economic development for the improving quality of life and ensuring the social development along with the environmental and ecological security. So the blue economy is, when we define the blue economy, it says very clearly that the economic development should be along with the social development and the environment and ecological security has to be ensured. So in all the, what we have seen that basically we need to use our knowledge about ocean for the socio-economic development of people as well as protecting the environment. Now, this is very important and uh, our prime minister in uh, seven years back, he said that the, the blue charkha, chakra, or a will in the India's flag represents the potential of blue revolution of the ocean economy. I think this is extremely good, which he mentioned when we started uh, working on the blue economy policy document. And uh, so basically we are saying, I mean, what he's trying to say that the, for further progress in coming uh, decades, we will have to depend on the ocean. Now, what are the major issues in the, one of course is the fisheries and with the fisheries, the coastal ecosystems are both linked to each other. There is a linear relationship between the health of coastal ecosystem and the fisheries. The second is the minerals and energy resources, both on the coastal area and in the deep sea. The third, when this kind of a development takes place, the what kind of hazards our coastal zone and marine environment is likely to face and what kind of response mechanism we have set up. Because without that response mechanism, the any investment made on the coast will be, uh, won't provide any returns because if it is caught damage. So this is also very important part that we need to understand the hazards. Now, when you want to work in the oceans, there are several treaties, laws, agreements about the ocean. I won't go into the details of it, but we need to have some idea that what are those things and how they function. We will come back to this when the, we will discuss about uh, the continental shelf and other things. Shipping and infrastructure. Actually, the shipping, shipbuilding in India was uh, well pronounced before uh, we were colonized. You know, there are extremely good ships made in uh, Gujarat, in Mandvi, is still being made. Uh, there are some places in the uh, Tamil Nadu and in Kerala. And the beauty of this ship's uh, building that they were making entirely from a wood and without having any nails and all. It's really fascinating uh, technology which we had for the shipbuilding. Of course, we lost it, but now again, it is uh, coming back. The manufacturing, trade and industries, if you see in last 30 years, the coastal area is being developed because of the lot of industry are now shifting to the coast for the export import trade and many new industries are coming up. Even if you see in Gujarat, the Mundra has uh, completely change the entire catch. So similarly, in many other parts of the country, the industrial activity has also increased. There are very strategic and security related issues uh, because of once you have this kind of a development, there are also issues 
we will not discuss this part because this itself could be a another major topic but this is also important now the other important thing is how do we account for the blue economy currently we don't have a framework where the the benefits which is coming out of ocean dependent activity is not uh, accounted for like even one example like the what could be the ecosystem services from a coral reef or a mangroves how do you account those services in terms of monetary gains so this framework also has to be designed and since there are several activities going to be on the coast because whatever you do want to do with the ocean will be primarily launched from the coastal regions so what we need is a coastal and marine spatial planning currently we have the laws related to what we call as a coastal regulation zone but this essentially talks about the coastal the land part of it and very near to the coast but we also need a marine part also included at a special planning both coastal and marine so this is the one which we need to do and we need a policy framework for promoting the blue economy so these are the issues we will not discuss all these issues but some of these issues now first is the uh, marine bio resources now the one thing which is uh, india has been doing is providing the potential fishery zone advisories this is a actually satellite based advisories completely based on the satellite data where the availability of a food is been decided based on the chlorophyll content and the environmental conditions based on decided based on the sea surface temperature sea surface wind and sea surface height or the currents which is we have all these information integrated into a model to provide this as services now this surveys is many people argued that this can lead to over exploitation but the our total yield estimates is about 5.31 million tons and roughly average capture is around 3.8 million tons and after we introduce this surveys there is no actual increase into the catch but what has increased is what we call as a search time has reduced and the effort which we put to catch a unit uh, that has reduced considerably so the time is reduced the search time is reduced and success rate has gone up which led to high benefit to the fisherman and according to one estimate the per trip now they are roughly on average making about 17800 rupees more than what they used to do before that now you can multiply this number with the 100000 fisher boats which is utilizing this services regularly and they roughly make about 240 to 250 trips in a year so you can count the benefit which is coming out of this from the very intricate uh, understanding about the physical and biological processes which is done through satellite images and translated into a economic benefit as well as the improvement in the social conditions of the fishers now this issue is also there is a another issue the many of you may be uh, reading in newspaper that the kerala we are not getting sufficient catch and many times the blame is on the overfishing and all but what our studies have found that actually because of the global warming the there is a shift of a fishery especially sardine and mackerel which is the pelagic fishery to the northern side and you can see that from 1985 onwards the reduction in the catch on the karnataka and kerala coast while the catch has increased on goa and maharashtra coasts also on the east coast 
which this fishery were completely absent earlier, now we are getting a pretty good catch on the East Coast also. Actually, last year, there was a record catch of sardine on the Maharashtra coast. So there is a definite change which is also occurring because of the uh, climate changes. And also, so we need to understand the issues when you don't get a sufficient fishery, there may be many other reasons than the just uh, overfishing. And this is also found to be uh, truth with the jellyfish, which competes with the sardine and mackerel for the food. And there is the increase a number of jellyfish population in the Kerala coast. And this is another reason uh, because this uh, jellyfish can survive in much harsher environment than the sardine and uh, mackerel. So this also is uh, happening and we can see large amount of jellyfish on the Kerala coast. So all these issues has to be uh, integrated for uh, managing the marine fishery. Now, there is another direct relationship, as I told you earlier, between the health of the ecosystem and the fisheries. And you can see that the mangroves is one of the extremely fertile nursery and breeding grounds of the has increased. And the increase is very uh, significant on Gujarat and Maharashtra coast. Now, these two coasts are most industrialized compared to the other coast. And you can see that the, so industry per se doesn't affect the uh, ecosystem, but if you, you need to manage the ecosystem in such a way that you have a better catch. Today, Gujarat is one of the largest producer of the fish and Maharashtra also is now coming up very fast as a major fishing. Well, if you can see, the Karnataka and Kerala has practically nil mangroves. So the habitat also is being destroyed or uh, for variety of reasons, and you get a lower fish catch in these regions. The other important thing, we will not go into details, but the carbon stock, which uh, is now about 52.5 million tons, just because of the mangroves. Actually, it has much more uh, uh, possibility of a carbon sequestration than even the uh, green evergreen forest. So this is one good sign that the overall over India, the uh, mangroves are increasing. It is also decreased in Andaman because of mostly tsunami and other issues uh, in last few years, but they are likely to come back. The other important thing which we need to also look at it uh, from the marine fishery, the harmful algal blooms. And this has increased, the incidence of a bloom has increased considerably. And uh, this is now, this service is provided to the fishermen uh, routinely, which is based on the sea surface temperature and the changes into sea surface temperature the anomalies in the chlorophyll, and there is a, what we call as a bloom index has been developed. And based on these three parameters, a warning or advisories are issued routinely. So when the algal bloom areas, it is not advisable to fish because some of this are the toxic blooms and it could be harmful if we eat those kind of fish. Now, with this scenario, what is now needed is that the changes which we find in the yield essentially depends on physical, chemical, biological processes. Of course, this from each species to species, it varies. Now, the satellite has been providing extremely good data on sea surface uh, temperature and chlorophyll over a period of time. In this uh, picture, we have seen the from May to September, that is the period when the phytoplanktons uh, develop and the upwelling starts and the fishery starts coming up. So this is uh, very important that this we know. 
Now, what we are not knowing is how we can use this physical and biological interrelationship to find out what likely yield going to be available for this season. Uh, something like what we are doing for the crops, that uh, this is what likely to happen. And I think this system uh, would be very useful. So we know that what is likely uh, yield going to be happen and the fishery plans can be made accordingly. So if we are going to get a less catch, or less yield, then the permission can be given to do accordingly. I think that can be done, but provided we have a very robust uh, models to prediction of a stock size. So this is, and this has to be done for a different fishery uh, because each has his own relationship with the physical and biological processes. So this is one area which we need to take up uh, urgently. And we did not have to restrict ourselves only to the Indian waters. Uh, this another area, the Antarctica in the Southern Ocean, this is a satellite image and the fronts which you see uh, are extremely productive for the krills. And uh, this is something like a prawn, but extremely uh, useful for omega-3. And this, uh, we have a right to catch in the Southern Ocean, but we are not able to do it because it needs a separate catching uh, mechanism and the processing has to be done on board because you can't bring all the catch way from the Antarctica to India. So different kinds of technology is required. But this is in one area which we need to focus on for further improving our uh, economy. There are many other things. The deep water fishery, which is almost 3.3 million tons, which is currently we are not uh, produce, I mean, catching any from the deep water fisher. Very minor about tuna in the East Coast and something on the Lakshweep. But it has a tremendous potential and uh, between 200 to 2000, this is, uh, has to be encouraged and promoted because then we have a sufficient uh, food even up to coming up to 2040. So this is an area which we need to develop. There are many other, uh, other fisheries of the mictophids. Now these are now developed in a low oxygen zone. And uh, the, as our estimate says about 100 million tons. But this is non-table fish but it can be used for uh, food for the livestock, poultry, and other aquaculture area. So this is an, another area which we need to further explore. But to do this, I think we need a lot of technological development for harvesting and post-harvesting technologies so that we can have a successful commercial venture. The other is a mariculture area. There are experiments done on the Tamil Nadu coast and extremely successful, but this again further has to be promoted so that this also can, uh, and this cage culture, you know, it takes about 10 to 11 months for uh, catch to mature. And uh, the fishermen can also have this additional income if they put this kind of a cage into the marine waters. The ornamental fishery, many of you may be knowing this, uh, in the near Tutikorin, we used to get a lot of pearls. Also near Jamnagar, we used to get pearls once upon a time. But this is now not much happening. And this is now some laboratory, these uh, uh, techniques have been developed and uh, we need to do further improvement on this. Also the ornamental fishery, which is many of us uh, keep in our house, is more and large imported. But now we have a hatchery developed into on Luxtrip Islands. And, but of course, it is a very small scale. It has a tremendous uh, commercial uh, capabilities. The lot of drugs and bioactive molecules, are, these are also being explored. There is a one uh, drug uh, is now getting to a scale where it could come become a drug 
there is a company in Bangalore which is developing, which essentially they took this from the Antarctica and now they are trying to build the uh, drug out of it. So which is now, but there could be many more uh, possibilities. But this is a very long process. It takes about 15 to 20 years from a bioactive molecule to go to a drugs. But this is another area which needs to be pursued. Coral reef is another area <clears throat> and uh, many are, uh, many, lot of work has been done. The lot of uh, monitoring, the zoning, the their location, their health, etc. is being done. What is now important is that there is a very serious uh, concern that because of the warming and acidification, the coral reefs may decline. We also know that the coral bleaching incidences have increased, but at the same time, we also have seen that corals do regenerate after the bleaching events. And soft corals, Acropora, which is generally succumb fast to increase in the uh, increasing temperature, but the, they also have a more resilience uh, to come back. So what we have seen that the areas which, Acropora areas which has bleached in the previous uh, in event, normally do not get bleached when the next event comes. So they develop some kind of a resistance. Now, it is not very clear whether the corals have developed the resistance or the algae, because they have a symbiotic relationship, both the algae and the coral. And this is very interesting area which we need to address that how, whether uh, the they are able to survive in the higher temperature. So whether coral will develop some kind of a resistance to the warming temperatures. The other thing which is happening that the sea level rise also, uh, which can modify the shoreline process and the how the sediment is moving around the islands. If you see the Luxweep Islands, it has a very peculiar shape, which is essentially because of the how the sea level land processes uh, interact with each other. And uh, we feel that the sediment movement in some of the islands where the corals are not healthy enough, the rising sea level may breach the burn and that uh, water can go in and the vulnerability of population uh, we need to assess. So, this is an, another area which we need to understand. Now, the cyclones are increasing and along with the eddies, uh, we have seen that the primary production also increases. But uh, this kind of a high primary production can also damage the corals. So uh, this, when the cyclones uh, develop in the coral reef area, especially Andaman Nicobar areas, or cyclone passing over Luxweep, we need to understand whether there is any damage happening because of the increased primary production to the corals. Now, if you see geologically, the, it has survived almost 450 million and different cycles of uh, acidification, rising temperature, sea level, it has gone through. So, and it has survived. Of course, there are different species have survived what was available and today. So, this, the health, of coral reef, we need to continuously monitor because there are a lot of ecosystem services coming out of this. So we need to understand that if the changes are occurring in coral reef, how the different uh, services uh, are getting affected. And the <clears throat> biodiversity is very critical and uh, we all know about it. And we, what we need to know is how the our activities and the climate change can impact the biodiversity. So very large program where the two programs, what we call as the census of marine life and the Indian Ocean Biogeographic Information System has been working where three degree by three degree grid, all from surface to the bottom, all fauna, flora, all are recorded and specifically put into the Indian Ocean Biogeographic Information System. Now, this work 
cannot be done by any single country or a, even group all so this you can see that the dots blue dots are all where the information is available but you can also see that there are more areas where information is not available so i think there is a lot of effort needs to be done to document uh, this and should be routinely like our census is done on land i think the marine life census every 10 years or so has to be done so that we understand if there are any changes taking place and this will help us to provide the understanding of the structure function and whether any particular species are vulnerable or not while doing this there are a lot of new uh, species were found and these are all recorded this is open source anybody who wants to have the information this is actually global system called uh, ocean biogeographic info system india has been uh, responsible for the indian ocean the all the data available on this is available now there are many services and uh, the climate change and the other anthropogenic activity uh, so many things will get affected now what we by and large understand that the provisioning service that means food fodder and fuel uh, how they will be affected we have some ideas but we have no idea about the other services like regulating service about sediment transport and coastal erosion wave attenuation how those things are going to be affected by the rising sea levels there is no clear understanding available as also the supporting service about the primary and secondary production carbon sequestration we have no idea that how it is going to be affected and same thing is uh, if we know all these three it would be useful for research and education so these are i think the important aspect where we need to do a lot of work uh, to do that and of course what is likely impact on the economic value of this so what when i was saying accounting framework we need to put a monetary value to each of this service so that we can know that when you do alternate development which would be more uh, beneficial now the ocean coastal and ocean minerals uh, energy resources and the related technology requirement now here we will just uh, couple of minutes we'll discuss about you practically everybody would know exclusive economic zone this is a 200 nautical miles and we have a sovereign right on the waters seabed and subsoil so we have about 2.2 million square kilometer so the almost 80% of the area has been surveyed and the details are available but uh, last 10 years or 12 years now there is another thing that the under the so law of the sea it has come that if you can prove that the continental shelf has formed because of the sediment of your land territory then we have a sovereign right up to 350 nautical miles now this will dramatically change and of course here waters we don't have any rights only on uh, seabed and subsoil now this we have to present our case to the commission on the legal continental shelf so this i will come back but the large amount of survey has been done 31000 of line kilometer to make our claim and the high seas are areas which is beyond ez and beyond national jurisdiction that is beyond continental shelf now this area is controlled by the international seabed authority and the exploration and exploitation has to be done after the concurrence of this so these three things are very important when we want to discuss about minerals and the energy <clears throat> now this is the area which you can see the hatch uh, which we can get additional and that our estimation is about 1.2 square uh, million square kilometer so if you add to 2 1.2 it will become 3.2 million square kilometer that means almost as good as our land area 
So this is a huge area. So that is large amount of investment in the exploring this and understanding this has to be done. Now, there are many other areas like Andaman Nicobar. Also, there are many submerged areas and these are not explored. I think there are many such things need to be explored because that can change your exclusive economic zone as well as the uh, areas under CZ, uh, CLCS. So this is a huge uh, potential uh, which is available for the exploration. Now, coastal placers, we have ample resources of coastal placers on the coast and near shore waters of the Kerala, Tamil Nadu, Andhra, Orissa, Maharashtra, uh, and many agencies, Geological Survey of India, Atomic Mineral Division, NIO, and others are involved in this kind of an exploration. So we have a fairly good idea what it all exists. And it's a huge resource of ilmenite, rutile, garnet, zircon, kyanite, sillimanite, magnetite, monazite. And the ilmenite reserves almost 22% of the world reserves. Now, the Ministry of Mines have notified five minutes by five minutes block for the exploration, but nobody is coming up. There are several issues and the market value of this is almost 150 billion. So there is a huge potential. We have all the necessary knowledge about the mining, about the beneficiation, all that has been done. The issue is only how we can, how and when we can mine. Currently, many of this, there is monazite is being used by uh, our rare earth, uh, Indian rare earth limited, but many others are simply exported to Japan and many other places uh, because we are not processing this mineral. So this is an area which needs our attention. Now, deep sea minerals, in, actually India is a pioneer status uh, in uh, manganese nodules. Uh, it is of manganese, copper, nickel, cobalt, and many other things. It's a huge area which we have, about 75,000 square kilometer area. Uh, this has been surveyed, and uh, the first mining site of 12.5 kilometer by 12.5 kilometer has been identified. The beneficiation process, everything has been now standardized. So the value is about 187 billion. We have 300 million metric tons of this metal. So it's a huge resource. Of course, the whether to mine or not, there are several other issues. Here also the environmental issues, all those assessment has to be made before actually mining starts. Similarly, the polymetallic sulfides, which is associated with oceanic ridges, have also high concentration of copper, lead, zinc, also along with that uh, gold, silver, etc. And this is uh, the exploration has started and uh, many new thinking, uh, new areas or new vents have been identified. Uh, but this will take some time before we really know the actual mineral potential. <clears throat> but a lot of uh, science also uh, is being done that uh, how the melting processes, how the ocean lithosphere is evolved. And one very important thing is, uh, it is believed that the life originated in ocean in such areas. Now the question is whether it is still happening or not. So there is a lot of science also which can be done in this area. Now, with the thrust on the green energy, the, there is the cobalt is very critical. And uh, we have identified certain cobalt rich areas uh, in the central Indian Ocean, uh, but we have not yet asked for the exploration right. I think the important thing is we need to ask for the exploration rights and then explore these areas as well. Now, to do all this, there is a lot of technological uh, development is required, and I will come back to that. <clears throat> Other uh, major area which uh, we need to address is on the energy. 
Of course, India do not have a very large amount of uh, hydrocarbons, but we have a huge resource of the gas hydrogen. This is a ice-like uh, crystalline form of a methane and water, which is available on East Coast in the shallow sediments uh, plenty. And this has been done by NIU and NGR, a huge uh, survey. And that rough estimate is that we have about a 1900 tera cubic meter of uh, gas hydrogen. Even if we recover only 10%, it could last for 100 years. So huge resources are available. But the problem is that uh, this is under pressure. These are available around two to 3,000 meter depth. So as soon as you bring the methane may escape. So we need to build a our, uh, exploitation technology by which this cannot be escaped. And now ONGC has a very serious about this. They have been uh, completed two deep drillings in the Manadi and the Andaman offshore. And they are quite hopeful uh, that this technology would be developed. ONGC has also taken a large amount of R&D into this region, along with Japan and other. So this is an, another uh, major resource which we need to address. There are many renewable energy. I mean, there is a lot of talk about and the potential about offshore wind energy. And it is estimated about 61 gigawatts. But also this potential is essentially based on the kind of wind which we have. But that is not the only information required when you want to develop offshore wind farms. You also need a lot of information about the kind of seabed it is. Because the when you want to set up this offshore wind farm, it's a huge uh, kind of a weight which will come. So we need to understand also along with the wind, the kind of seabed available and many other the currents, these, that. So those things are yet to be done. Also, it will need a very specialized kind of uh, infrastructure, port facilities, the custom built vessels, because these turbines are huge. You can't uh, install them with these ships which we have available. So many such things has to be done. The wave, we do not have a large uh, wave uh, variability in the wave is very low only during monsoon we get and but there are other things which is being developed is a floating wave power systems uh, which is a small and can uh, supply power to the small settlements in islands and all that so this kind of thing also the currency is another which we need to uh, build but i think the main issue is uh, like in gulf of kambat and kach in kind of a turbines which we need, which can function in high lease, uh, highly turbid water, that has to be developed. The thermal energy is a <coughs> tremendous scope. And this, there is only one plant uh, in the world today functioning about 0.1 megawatt or so. But this has a tremendous potential. And I think the how we can convert this energy into a uh, thermal energy into the electricity is very important. And a lot of uh, experiments are currently going into. The biofuel from marine algae, this has been done. Many people have produced the biodiesel. But the issue is where you have a, that kind of a land or a place where you can produce million tons, uh, million liters a day or in a month. So this, the technology is available, but I'm not sure whether it can be really commercialized. Now, many technology have been developed along with this. One is the soil tester, which uh, essentially provides uh, <coughs> the strength, the mechanical strength of the seabed. This has been developed and this has been functioning very well. Uh, the crawler, uh, which can collect the manganese nodule has been developed. Also the riser by which you can send the nodules up also has been developed. And this has been demonstrated at 6,000 meters. The remotely operable vehicles, it is something like a satellite which you have in space. And this has a payload capacity of 150 
kilogram, you can put uh, robotic arms, you can put uh, any sensors, uh, collect uh, land uh, sample collection, many other things you can accomplish by this. This also has been tested up to 6,000 meter. And the core, which you need in, suppose in gas hydrates and all at depth of 3,000 meters, where you need about 100, 150 meters of core to assess the uh, occurrence and nature of the gas hydrate is also developed. So many such things are available and many of these technologies are now available with the industry as well. But the issue is when we will be taking a decision to mine. Now the submersible, man submersible is also being developed along with the ISRO, uh, the titanium <coughs> shell uh, cabin sphere, which is now being developed along with the ISRO. And the many others, other systems are being developed at the NIOT. Most of the things are ready. This has been tested at up to 500 meters. And once the shell is ready, I think the it will the other system will be shifted and it will be tested at the 6,000 meters. The plan is uh, in 2024, uh, this will be launched uh, to understand what all lies at the depth. And these are a lot of other use uh, in the ecology and uh, understanding the geology part, many other things. And this all will be possible after 2004. The water is going to be a major issue in coming years. And as the more and more development takes place on the coast, we need a fresh water supply. And especially in the islands like Luxweep and all, there is no fresh water supply. So the technology developed what is called as a low temperature thermal desalination has worked extremely well in the Luxweep. And the three islands are already having these plants. Another two are nearing completion and four more will be done in the next one year. So all Luxweep Islands will have a fresh water uh, provided from uh, this technology. And uh, this has drastically reduced the uh, stomach related ailments into the islanders. And uh, they are now much better health wise than the what they used to drink uh, the polluted water. So this technology, and this is the only in India, these kind of a six plants are working. Many countries have tried. The physics is very simple. You bring the surface water to a vacuum and it will start boiling. And then you bring cold water from 800 to 1000 meter, cool it. You get a vapor, which is a cold vapor, which is a fresh water. And uh, this is not very expensive. It's about six. Uh, cost is about uh, 10 paisa or something per liter. It's not very expensive. Now, same technology can be used in uh, thermal power power plants. Is Tutikorin now is going to use this technology uh, for generating the boil, boiler class water from the used water. So this would be, and part of the water will be also supplied for the drinking into other areas. Now, the important thing, this can work only in areas like islands and the where you have thermal power station. But the technology and the is now the project report has been prepared for 10 million liters on the coast, <clears throat> which could be about 30, 40 kilometers away from the coast. And uh, this can be done. The initial investment is a little high. It may be around 2000 crore, but I'm sure that in coming years, when the water scarcity increases, we may have to depend on this kind of plants. And it will work pretty well. It doesn't affect the environment because in this process, you don't uh, send back the very uh, the brine back to this. It is more or less same water is thrown back because actual water is used is about 10 to 12% only. So the West, which is discharged, is more or less same as it is. So it assimilates pretty fast. And the uh, the water which is brought back from the depth has a very high nutrients. So we have also found that the fish catch also increases 
around islands where this water is released. So it's quite environmental friendly uh, technology, unlike RO or many other technologies which is being used. The other area is uh, major area is a tourism. And uh, here we now routinely, uh, the certification process has started. This is a hidden beach in Pondicherry. Uh, in Gujarat also, Sivrajpur is the similar uh, beach. Now, blue flag gives a certification based on the water quality of this area, the safety, the facilities which is available on beach related to um, bathing and other washroom and other things. And uh, now 18 beaches on India has been identified given this kind of a certificate. And we have Beaches now, uh, some of the beaches they charge a, a small fee of uh, five rupees or so, and uh, they all have become self sufficient. But it is very neat and clean beach, water quality, everything is so it's really. And we are now planning that 100 such beaches should be planned on this uh, coast, coastal region. It's not changing. Yeah. Now, there are many other things which uh, <clears throat> I will not go into the details, but one simple number that the our Sagarmala, which is port-led development and many other uh, programs related to it, also the increase uh, activity on the coast and uh, about 9.7 trillion rupees will be invested on the coast. So, uh, what we need is the there is a large amount of development, but as I told you, we also need to focus on the ecosystem uh, protection and conservation. So we need a what we call as a coastal marine spatial planning. This is a basically science-based, so it takes care of all the information about the coast and the marine. And then a specific issue of a specific region is addressed for how the development can be done while protecting the this. So this has many such things. Then India is one of the few countries where we have a large amount of the details on this. I'll briefly touch upon these issues. One is the uh, coastal uh, regulation zone. Uh, this entire country has now the management plans uh, for the coastal zone and uh, the Coastal regulation zone means from high tide line to 500 meters, there is a restriction and prohibition of certain activities. Now, the most important thing was the high tide line. And initially in 92, when this was issued, there were a lot of confusion about the high tide line. And now government has agreed that we must use the satellite data to delineate the high tide line. And this is all our country's maps are now prepared using satellite data. And it has a lot of information on the ecosystem and based on that, the management plans are prepared. So this would be one of the major input to the coastal and marine area planning. The second input which is required is on the ocean state forecast and what kind of a state. And this essentially all this information on waves, currents, mixed layer depth, sea surface temperature is the forecasts are provided essentially uh, with the satellite inputs. And uh, plus, of course, the buoy and other inputs, but essentially the models uses the satellite-based input. Now, this is done for the globe, for the Indian Ocean, for the Arabian Sea, as well as very specific ports, about 178 ports, where all such information is provided. So this is another major which we have the information which could go into the coastal and marine area planning. About the hazards, which is very important. So you all know we have extremely good system now for cyclone prediction and the state government and the uh, NDMA has extremely good response mechanism. And we have been seeing that the uh, lives lost has come down from uh, 10,000 in 90s to 10, 12 uh, of that kind. That also because some people do not 
uh, follow or the information may not have reached to them. So this system is also in a place. The tsunami warning system, which is also in place uh, for any danger coming. And this is the very innovative system India has been using. And we are the only country providing location specific forecast. That means every 50 kilometer we give a forecast that is run up height and the travel time at every 50, unlike Japan and US, which provide basin wide uh, forecast. So this is also in place and last 15 years, it has not given a single false warning. So this is also in place as far as the planning is concerned. <clears throat> the floods which we, many of you may be listening now in Bangalore and uh, Pakistan and many, but the coastal floods is another major issue which is Chennai has uh, faced, Bombay has faced. So there is a very specific uh, scheme, uh, system has been developed where, of course, it uses uh, tidal models, hydraulic models, hydrology models, and many other weather models. Uh, but ultimately, all this is integrated at a ward level. And what kind of inundation is expected is now provided. So this system has been now put in place in Chennai and now Bombay also. So the administrator knows exactly which areas are likely to be inundated and at what level. So the accordingly, the planning, uh, the rescue and relief operations can be planned. The erosion is another area. So this, uh, every year, the areas which are under erosion of different types uh, is continuously done where we provide where the erosion is occurring, where the deposition is occurring, where there is no change, what we call as a relative stability or equilibrium beach. So this information is also now available. Also this uh, on Pondicherry, the technology and the science were used to bring back the beach. The Pondicherry, those who have gone as a beautiful beach, which lost and now with uh, very efficient uh, shore protection measures, which has a reef, underwater reef, and the beach nourishment together, now the beach has come back. And uh, this, uh, I think, is, and you don't see anything on the surface, unlike groins and all, which you see on the surface. This is underwater reef. We have used the principle like the coral reef, and the similar thing has been done, and the bridge has been brought back. Also for the entire country, uh, the, which are the vulnerable areas? Because if you want to set up industry and all, the entire country maps are available. And these are essentially uh, also done based on the satellite data, especially the information related to shoreline change, coastal slope, the significant wave heights, and the elevation and the coastal geomap all comes from the satellites. And then there is a model which we use to identify all this information is now available. We are also planning in coming years, uh, the climate services. Currently we provide weather like sea state for next five days, three days like that. But what we need is now seasonal to decadal time scale forecast. And uh, this work has now started where we can provide the information on sea level changes, cyclone intensity and frequency, storm surge, and very important is about changes in the biochemistry ecosystem, et cetera, and primary. What likely changes are going to happen? And uh, I must uh, say that there's a lot of work which I have not included, the work done by the group in PRL about geostressors in NIU on biogeochemistry, in the Institute of Science on the Bay of Bengal mixing. And so there are several large programs are going on in the country where this understanding is going on. The fish, fishery and fish stock I explained to you and overall the ocean health. So these are the things which would need uh, for promoting the blue economy. All this, the seasonal to decadal timescale predictions like monsoon we are giving seasonal predictions. I think we need to start the seasonal predictions of this as well. Now ocean health has become very important. And one thing which is very important is 
the input which goes to the nutrients input from the agriculture as well as the coastal population and the industrial out. All this we need to monitor. And there are certain issues in this. I won't go into the details of this, but there is an extremely good program going on for last 25, 30 years now, 92 to 20, 30 years, about the several places along the Indian coast. The water quality is continuously three times in a year uh, has been uh, measured. Now, this, uh, some of this thing we already discussed about the uh, harmful algal blooms. And, uh, but what we need now that the climate change and impacts because that will going to change certain things, how the land use is going to change because of the development and this kind of a model which we need to build that what kind of uh, changes which will come into the water quality if this kind of developmental activities is taken up on the coast. So this is an area which we need to address. Other area which is very important for us to address is on the microplastics. <clears throat> microplastics is a small, minute uh, particles of uh, plastics, which ultimately degrades into small, small particles. Now, these particles are something like climate change. You know, they survive for 70 to 80 years. Even if they broke in a smaller piece, it is highly dangerous. Why it is? Because they, when they float on the ocean, they provide a substrate for microbes to travel from place A to B, and which they could be invasive species. Now, this could be, there are certain cases on the northwest coast of uh, US and Canada. This kind of uh, invasive species have introduced certain kind of a disease into fish. We have not noticed it here, but of course, nobody has looked from that angle. So this microplastics, what it is all does, and this definitely goes into the stomach of fish, and it also affects their liver functions and many other things. So this microplastic has to be monitored. And uh, this is an area I think is very critical for us that how the overall marine litter is we are discharging and what is its impact on the coastal and marine ecosystem and ultimately on the services. <clears throat> there are a lot of new initiatives uh, being done. Uh, the second International Indian Ocean Expedition, which started in 2015, which has now extended up to 2015, and uh, probably it may be up to 2030, now, this uh, itself has done tremendous work on generating new knowledge on variety of the aspects. I won't go into the details, but those who are interested on this, there is a lot of papers and have come up which uh, defines about the monsoon, about the ecosystems, about the geological, biological processes, and what the how the human is likely to be benefited from this. All this together is being done under these expeditions. Now, large amount of data has been collected over the Indian Ocean, uh, which could be from satellite, maybe from ship cruises, from moorings, from a drifting buoys, and many others. Now, each platform measures certain properties, like SST is measured from all the properties. And uh, we need a system by which we can integrate all heterogeneous data. That means if I need a specific information about either specific region or a, along a specific transect, I should get, say, SST for that period. I am not, the user may not be worried whether it is from SST or a drifting buoys or a mooring or whatever it is. So this system is now being developed uh, that the, all the information into a digital form and there would be algorithms where you integrate the different uh, data sets and provide the information as required. And also you can visualize in 3D and 4D dimension. So this is, I think is 
are very important for us so that we can promote the uh, blue economy. Now, <clears throat> last few things. One is the ocean accounting framework. Now, this is the area which is not much work has been done. So, the questions which we, what is the production? What is the sustainability? And who is benefiting? Now, these questions we need to answer. And for that, we need an accounting framework. Now, how we can do that? A lot of information which is available in a different formats, a map, data, statistics, and what scientists generate the information and what economists generate information, what social scientists generate information, all these three are not in a format in which it can be directly integrated. So we need to build the methods that how we integrate this information. The second is how we can put a value to ecosystem and biodiversity, which can go into the planet so that this is also counted. And then we also measure the progress that this is development has come from the ocean and this is how much GDP, et cetera, is that. So we need this complete information or the framework for the informed decision-making. Because today uh, we don't know actually how much ocean is really contributing to our economy. And I say ocean doesn't mean only the fishery or minerals, but also the ecosystem and all the indirect benefits of the other ecosystem services, which is also provided. Now, <clears throat> this the I think this is what a scenario is. And I think in India, this is uh, very important that it has been realized that the economic growth prospect will not be possible beyond 2030 unless we have a large investment in coastal and ocean environment. So this has been realized. And as a first step, the government has announced the deep ocean mission, uh, which is almost 4,000 crore, uh, to gain the different knowledge about resources, developing technologies to harness them. And this is already being implemented and I'm sure that uh, in next few years, two to three years, we'll see the benefits coming out from the uh, deep ocean mission. Now, the other thing is the scientific data, as I told you, the, with the environment, social and economic data. I think this is another major requirement that we develop this accounting system so that we can say that what is the relevance of oceans into the socio-economic development of the country. And as there are many institutes, many line ministries are involved, including state government, we also need how the, what kind of a institutional framework which you need so that the investment which you make in infrastructure, human resources, finance, and governance that can be developed. So this institutional framework is also very useful. And lastly, I would like to say that it has to be managed as, as a valuable assets so that we can have use the benefit in sustainable way. Lastly, of course, uh, this is very old, 30 years old, but still valid. And I think the ocean is what we need to focus to make the sustainability uh, in our planet. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Naikji, for this fascinating and uh, very, very informative talk, giving us a broad overview of various things that are happening in an in international scenario and national scenario uh, and uh, the priorities, uh, the national priorities and where uh, and, and various programs that that government is focusing on and uh, uh, on various aspects of biodiversity and marine resources that we can tap into in the future it's been a really eye opener and uh, you know giving us a, on one plate various you know menus of various uh, facets of uh, things that are happening in the country 
thank you very much for this wonderful talk. I'm sure there are many uh, questions uh, from, from our audience. I will now invite my colleague, uh, Dr. Arvind Singh, to conduct that session. Okay, yes. thank you, Professor Raju. Uh, and thank you, Professor, uh, Dr. Nayak, for your very comprehensive over overview of just not uh, blue economy, but you have touched many parts of the fundamental ocean sciences as well. So we will have a lot of questions. So as per our convention, first I would like to invite the, the people who have joined on WebEx panel. So please raise your hand. And then at the end, I will take the questions from the YouTube, which are already. I can see one hand, Dr. Bharat. You may please go ahead, Dr. Bharat. Thank you, Dr. Nayak, for a very excellent talk, and uh, it was very informative, very exhaustive, covering many aspects, and some total is that oceans for sustainable development. Uh, my question is with respect to the, um, you mentioned about a deep ocean mission of Government of India. Can you just a little bit elaborate on that and what is the planning of the government and how long this mission is going to continue? Yeah, as of now, it is going to be for next five years. And uh, the major area which they are addressing is one is the resources, that means uh, the fishery and the mineral resources, the climate services, which is required for the next decade or so and the technology which is to be developed for that. So this is in the broad area and uh, the many institutes are involved. Uh, the primary institutes which are involved is of course MOES, uh, NIOP, INCOIS, NCPOR and CMLRE. But I understand that they have a large uh, collaboration with many other uh, institutes uh, in the country and also the it's being managed by a <coughs> multi uh, ministerial uh, apex committee uh, because there are many stakeholders into different different areas so they have, i think uh, started last year and uh, the current uh, my understanding is that the progress has been extremely good. The yesterday, of course, I don't know about the others, but NIOT yesterday, I was in NIOT and they told that they are on schedule as far as the submersibles and uh, some of the technologies which they have already built has been transferred to industry. And uh, they are now trying to, you know, find the market. Of course, the market may be more in the country as well. Mm -hmm. So, my feeling is that uh, it is on right track, but uh, I still feel is the in deep ocean mission, the uh, focus is more on the building technologies for the resources. Right? Uh, we need a equal focus on the science part as well, because I believe is that whatever we are able to achieve today in uh, fishery or anything, it is the very long work done by many in uh, just if you say placer minerals, there are many people who have worked or you take polymetallic nodules. There may have been uh, 20, 25 expeditions there and the, some two, 300 people would have involved. Then we know this information. So I think uh, for continuing uh, our uh, dependence on ocean. I think equal amount we need to also invest into the science part, which today, in my view, I think we don't, we need to understand more about the biogeochemistry of the ocean, especially in both and their role in uh, monsoon and all, though there are a lot of understanding, but I think there are still a lot of areas which needs our uh, focus on. So equal amount should have been not equal, but I would say equal emphasis should have been on the science as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Arvind, just uh, one curious question. Okay. 
in case you allow me. Yeah, please go ahead. OK, uh, we know that there is always a talk of uh, sea level rise, you know, and also uh, the sea surface temperatures. So the sea level rise and the relationship to sea surface temperatures. Can you throw some light on that? <clears throat> of course, we know that the once warming takes place, the physical, the expansion itself will uh, make the rise. Uh, but what we know is a uh, uh, average rise. Now, this rise is not going to translate. Uh, suppose if we want to do or anything on a course, I can't take that number. Three millimeter is rising every year. Their translation onto the coast is going to be completely different. It will also be affected by the kind of currents, waves, winds, and all those things. So what is now needed is that we need the projections which we may have on the sea level. We need to translate into how it is going to affect the particular coast as a much more in a uh, if you can't do it uh, very specific, but at least region wise, like West Coast, East Coast to begin with, and both would be quite different. You know, West Coast and East Coast fundamentally are different when fresh water dominated and the saline water. So it is going to be completely different. The amount of heat absorbed by the Bay of Bengal is much larger than the uh, Arabian Sea. The winds are different. So there are several things are different. That understanding, I don't think we have. Also, there is a uh, there is a sea level variability also, a decadal sea level variability. And uh, that also will affect. So there are many things in my view are not known. Uh, what we know is only average rise. And, but that average rise is not going to help us to understand our vulnerability to the sea level rise. Many people have tried, uh, you know, they assume when I say 0.5 meter will be uh, by 2050, they draw 0.5 meter contour and say this area will be inundated. See, sea level doesn't behave in that fashion. There will be dramatic changes in how the individual landform will respond to the rise. I mean, if I give you an example like a beach, if beach is overnourished, the, that beach will not get affected. But if beach is undernourished, it will get eroded. The estuaries will become widened because same amount of water has to come. I mean, increased amount of water has to go and come back. So the estuaries will widen. If they widen, then there will be ero erosion along uh, those things. So each landform is going to respond quite differently. Now that understanding, I don't see. And I think there is a real need for us to model this. And the first requirement is that at local level, what is likely to be rise, how it is going to change currents and other things, and what kind of a landform we have that will uh, respond. Like corals, corals, if there is a healthy coral, it will grow along with the sea level rise, and there won't be any issue. But if the corals are uh, dead or degraded, it will not be able to rise with the sea level. Or mangroves will go back, is move towards the landwards. So many such things are likely to happen. But fundamental requirement is our understanding of projections of sea level on the coast, which is, I, I mean, at least I'm not aware of the work that, but Arvind may be knowing better than me, he would be able to tell. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Dr. Naik. So, Dr. Bharadwaj and I can discuss it later, the sea level rise. Meanwhile, I would like to invite Dr. Adi Deshpande to ask a question. <clears throat> thank you very much, Arvin. Shrajbhai, thank you very much for this wonderful uh, overview. And uh, I have a few questions. The first question uh, uh, is related to the title of your talk, From Ocean Science to Blue Economy. Now, as you are aware that PRL has been uh, contributing to oceanography, we have a strong group in oceanography and uh, 
ocean current, sedimentation rate, or nutrient cycling and ocean biogeochemistry. So this is the domain in which we have been working. Uh, but the the problem arises is that when someone asks that, okay, your basic research, how does it directly related to uh, you know relates to blue economy, or how are you contributing to society? So at that time, the scientific outcome is not in that form which can be readily useful for economic uh, purpose. So my request to you is that would you please uh, throw some light on what kind of uh, research programs from basic research institutes are expected or recommended, which will be useful to blue economy. So I think it would be really useful. I mean, I didn't uh, discuss much about the, the programs of your PRL geostracers and many other uh, biogeochemistry related. A lot of work has been done. See, if you take one example, say productivity of an ocean. Now, when I want to do that, I need a lot of information about what kind of uh, biogeochemical processes are going on, what is their variability, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, that is the information which uh, PRL has been generating and IO has been generating. So, that it will take some time. It has to reach to a certain level that when they say, yes, this is what I can do and this is my model, this is what likely productivity change is likely to have. Then it would become a useful. But that doesn't mean that the current what you are doing is not useful. It is a stepping one by one stone uh, uh, steps which will allow us to go to the information which we need. Like uh, 20 years or 25 years back when the polymetallic nodule program started, after two years, if somebody asks what you are going to do, they will say, I don't know. But today we know that what kind of uh, polymetallic nodules, where they have spread, what is their mode of occurrence, how much metal they contain, what kind of metal they can. It took 20 years to come to this level when we are talking that I can convert into economic benefits. So all this research has to continue. And that is what I told to Anil also, that we need to invest into the science as well. If you think that today, everything we want to do on a societal benefit or economic benefit or anything, then nothing will happen unless you keep on investing that. It has a time lag between the science and to convert it to a technology or anything. So I don't think uh, there is any difference. Only the way we see it or way somebody sees this, I think we have to educate them that this is how it will grow. Electronics, you know, electron was discovered long back, but electronics didn't come next day. It takes his own time. So I think we should allow that time and uh, we should not look at the uh, science is something which is, you know, uh, we have nothing else to do. So we are doing something, you know, that kind of. I think it's very important that the basic will start from that then only it will get converted into uh, some kind of useful information. Yeah, thank you very much for this answer because uh, this encourages at times the pointed questions are such that we may find that we are not able to contribute directly to societal benefit, but your uh, answer is quite encouraging. Thank you very much for that. Now, I have another question that you mentioned about the uh, differences in the geographical distribution of uh, sardine and markel. You said that in Kerala and uh, Karnataka, it has uh, reduced. And uh, in Maharashtra, it has, uh, it has been increasing and also in the East Coast. So would you please uh, comment on the reasons behind that? Why are there geographical differences? In yeah, this environment is changing. In a sense, you know, this is not in India. Everywhere, the fishery is moving towards poleward because the the certain fishery, you know, they are very used to certain level of a temperature mm -hmm. and they can sustain that temperature changes for some time. But if it is continuously high, then they would shift to the cooler regions or where the environment is more suitable. So this has been noticed uh, everywhere. Here, 
we have data only on uh, mackerel and sardine, but I'm sure the other fishery also would be happening uh, this kind of thing. And this is what, uh, when the fishermen now in Kerala, you know, they have adapted to this. So now they concentrate more on catching squids. And uh, what they use is a plastic. Uh, they provide the hard substrate there so the squid can come. And uh, so they uh, try to catch uh, squids now. So the people have already started adapting to the changes which are occurring without our realizing. Mm -hmm. So this, the what is not happening, we are not paid sufficient attention to this. So you ask this, now this basic science, why this is happening or what other species are likely to change is very critical question. But you need to understand the basics about how the physical and biological processes are interacting in the view of uh, rising sea level and the rising uh, temperature. That we don't know. So that is where the basic science comes into. Once we know, then the next question will come that how we can apply that. So I think uh, there is a very wrong notion among politicians and many others that, you know, everything you have to do uh, is uh, directly applicable. It may be true for certain organizations, like if it is a CSIR, I will agree, because their role is scientific and industrial research. How scientific translates into industry? So that is different. But I don't think the PRL role is that. So each institute has a definite role. And I think you can't do everything. Those who are uh, doing the operational work can't do the science. And science, those who are doing science should not do the operational work. Right. Because you need different skills mm -hmm. and the qualification. So I think uh, we need to explain to them that this is not the way to address these issues. That's what I feel and I always say this to whoever asks me this. Thank you very much. And I have one more question. You also commented about the mangroves uh, along the Gujarat coast and uh, it's some relevance to industries. So would you please uh, throw some more light on that, that uh, are they related? Uh, yeah, yeah. See, what has happened is uh, in 75, uh, we'll take example of uh, Gulf of Kutch. Uh, there was a sand mining going on, the carbonate sand mining for the cement. And that affected corals and mangroves. And the, they were dwindling. So in 1983, this uh, mining was stopped. And uh, this area was declared as a marine national park. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have analyzed this uh, data from 75 and onwards. And we found that after declaring this marine national park, the mangroves started coming back. The coral reef also uh, regenerated. And if you go to Pirotan now, you can see beautiful uh, corals around. Uh, but in late 90s, again, the large scale industrial development started in area. But the mangroves have not reduced. Actually, in Gujarat, Mangroves have increased. So what I'm trying to say that it is not that the industry comes, mangrove will die. We also need to take necessary conservation measures with the Gujarat Forest Department has done an excellent job. Uh, mangroves have increased on the Gujarat coast. And uh, there is, of course, uh, not regeneration, but a lot of plantation, I came to know recently, there is a 10,000 hectares plantation is being now planned on the Gujarat coast, which will definitely generate a lot of other services, fishery and all. Uh, it will further improve upon. So that doesn't mean I'm saying that it doesn't affect. Like if you discharge the pollutants, it will affect. But just for industry coming, that means everything will go bad. That concept is not correct. What is needed is that we need to use our knowledge about the ecosystem, our knowledge about the 
uh, effluent which is being discharged into the water, how they react, to, uh, interact with each other, what kind of changes it is bringing, and then we should make that statement. We just make a statement that any industry is bad, and uh, we need to, uh, that is not true. Even the many times, you know, the one, another major pollution on the coastal waters, especially Bay of Bengal, is to the nutrients, which is coming from the agriculture area. So it is, and all these activities are also important. So we can't say, stop using fertilizer. You know, Sri Lanka did, but then they land up into trouble. So you can't do that. But I'm trying to say that the our knowledge about the both, we should use that how we can elevate this problem. And there are ways and means to provide answer or sometimes, uh, you know, the solution to these issues. Thank you so much, Sarajibai. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. for answering these questions. And also, thanks to Dr. Deshpande for raising question. And I'm, I think normally in other forum, Dr. Deshpande would be answering this question and Dr. I would be asking this. So it's good to hear the other side always. Okay, now I would like to invite uh, Dr. Ravi Bhushan to ask a question. Uh, uh, good evening, sir. Ravi Bhushan here. Yeah, Ravi. <laughs> okay, so it was very nice and enlightening talk from you. So in fact, uh, during your uh, tenure of uh, Secretary MOES, you were very instrumental in enhancing the oceanographic research capabilities of India. And also, I think so. It led pathway to the blue economy. That was the time I remember. And most of the topics you talked on, or today you spoke, basically somewhere it was initiated during your tenure, uh, which have now yielded many good results in terms of your fishery uh, fisheries predictions or climate predictions. And uh, I would like to. I have a couple of questions. One is that, like you mentioned about harmful algal blooms. So in the last few decades, has that uh, harmful algal blooms have increased because of eutrophication? And if so, it, has it resulted in uh, like a fish, uh, shift in fish catch and shift in mortalities, fish mortalities? Uh, that's the first question. And second question is that where we, uh, where India stands in terms of its potential for mining manganese nodules? in terms of retrieving uh, cost and actual yield? Yeah, no, al algal blooms uh, frequency has definitely increased. There is no doubt about it, about the eutrophication and the, when it is continuously now monitor, we know it is more. Also some of the Northwest, uh, which you know that uh, yeah. Ramesh and all were working on that, uh, noctilata blooms there also we have seen that the change is into more toxic than the what it used to be the blooms so earlier blooms were non-toxic now some of the blooms have become more toxic and uh, there are cases though there are not clear recording of how much uh, damage done to the fishery because there is no mechanism currently which actually monitors the bloom and sees that how much uh, fish has died or whatever happened. There is no mechanism in place. So uh, I can't answer, but there are reports that the many areas, the <coughs> either is reduced when the uh, bloom comes. One thing is uh, many times this bloom comes in non-fishing season, like uh, uh, the trichodacium by and large starts in April, May. So there is not much fishery at that time. So, and after that, uh, the, uh, the ban starts. So uh, may not have much effect, but the blooms, which is happening in uh, January, February, March, is definitely affecting the fishery, but uh, the actual data on this is not available actually. Somebody like uh, Fishery Survey of India or CMFRI, CMFRI catches only landing data. So you don't know from where actually it has come. So, but the Fishery Survey of India should monitor, once you know that the bloom is there, what happens uh, in those regions, the changes which are occurring, I think it's very important to monitor. <clears throat> the second question, 
the potential is very high. Uh, but that doesn't mean that India is going to mine tomorrow. The idea is that uh, we should be ready with the technology if the need arises. Because today, if you want to do this, you need a complete processing to be done from where you mine, because it's almost 3,000 kilometers away. You can't bring all the nodules here. So there are many other things which needs to be done. Also, whether we need that much manganese, because other problem which we occur is, I need cobalt, but I need, uh, I get manganese also along with it. Whether I need that. Okay. <clears throat> so a lot of decisions have to be uh, made when we are ready. But uh, if you don't build the technology, and if there is a need, at that time, if you go to a market, you may have to pay heavy price. What we paid uh, for petroleum, we were never ready. And everything is uh, being imported. So now, if we can build the technology, and this technology, when you build, it has a lot of other uh, advantage, like when they were uh, building the ROV, which can work at the uh, 6,000 meters, they also build another ROV, uh, which can work in Antarctica. And in Antarctica, it proved to be extremely useful to see what is happening below the, uh, the ice shelf. So, which was earlier, no information was available. So they started looking at those, how the calving is taking place. And they also put now uh, hydrophones and other along with it, and classifying the noise that when the calving may, may start, you know, those kind of thing. So th there is a lot of side, then the uh, monitoring of the submarine cables, you know, you need a ROE to see how they are good. So a lot of other, uh, this technology is being put to use. So the investment do not go west. It has a lot of other side benefits. So I think we need to continue to build the technologies. Only when it is to be used is a economic and commercial decision has to be taken at that particular time when we need to. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks again, Dr. Naik. So, I don't see any raised hand in the WebEx channel. Uh, but before I proceed to read the questions from the YouTube, I wanted to ask Dr. Naik, do you have time? Because we have extended session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I took okay. a little more time than what I promised, so I will no problem. <laughs> no, no, we have a lot of time, so it is on. So, have time. so it is good that you have time. So, thank you yeah, for answering. I not see my watch, uh, so... That's good. It took 15 so will... 20 minutes extra. <laughs> okay, so now I have questions uh, from the YouTube channel. I have four questions. I will read them one by one. So the first question, which you partly answered, uh, that Dr. Deshpande has asked, and the question is by Dr. Krishnan. Uh, the question is whether regime shift in oil sardines is related to changes in upwelling zone in a changing climate. And I also have a similar question because we know ocean we have multiple parameters and your analysis is that that this is the migration because of change in temperature but there you also shown some other analysis where oxygen also plays an important, important yes. role and oxygen minimum zones are expanding the salinity of the uh, ocean is changing there is a special change the southern of the arabian sea is getting is getting more fresher so fresher. yeah there are multiple factors so how sure we are that this is just the migration and not anything else in the ocean. Yeah, I mean, I agree fully with you. You know, the Bay of Bengal water which is right up to Kerala. There is no doubt about it, the mini oxygen minimum zone. But the large scale shifting which is uh, taking place is primarily because of the change in the, because the upwelling, there may be some changes year to year and all that, uh, maybe delayed or advanced or something like that, because it's also linked with the monsoon, how the monsoon and all that. But what we are seeing consistently, it is not one year or two years. From 85 onwards, now 20, 
five, seven years. Of course, data which I gave is up to 2010. But continuously we are seeing that this is happening. And the major change which is occurred is in the temperature. Though along with temperature, there will be many other uh, changes. So, of course, this is more of an empirical evidence what we have now. Uh, but somebody can, you know, look at more closely and see that why this thing is happening. Because our understanding is that there are the fish, the two things are most critical for fish. One is the food availability and second is the environment. Now, if these two changes are there, then the fish will shift. So, and these two changes are occurring. So along with the temperature, and you can see that the picture which I showed, the availability of uh, chlorophyll all along the coast is pretty well good. There is no problem as far as food is concerned. Only thing which is major change is uh, temperature. So that's why we believe that the temperature which has mainly caused but I agree with you. I can't say that uh, the other parameters are not important. But somebody has to look into this. Currently, our observation is that these two matches fairly well. We are trying to model this. But the problem is, uh, you know, the uh, temperature data of the past where you need is not available. So suppose if we have a fishery data and this fishery data also, which is available is a landing data. It, is, it does not have a actual location. So you, we assume that uh, whatever landed at X place is by and large collected from that region. But that assumption is not 100% right because fishermen go to where they get a better price. And where he has collected also, we do not have the information on the uh, temperature and other parameters. So actually, NIO, Shankar and uh, Anil and his group started this program that to measure uh, fish catch and all other properties and all. I'm not aware what ultimate outcome of this, but I'm sure that kind of an exercise will tell us exactly what is happening. Okay, thank you. So next question is by Professor Ashok Kumar Singhvi. Is he says thanks for the good overview, and then he's asking, do we understand long-term impact of large-scale deep sea mining on biogeochemical cycles? Recently, there have been many concerns ex expressed. Yeah, yeah. The, the of course, whatever you do, there would be effect. Like when you do mining on land. A lot of things have changed. Uh, the same thing, you know, when you mine on the deep sea bed, things will be definitely affected. Now, so what is being done is now the lot of environmental data is being collected at the seabed and the whole environment to see that if we develop, if we want to mine, how this thing will get disturbed. So this is one area which is now being uh, done. And the concern is very valid, but at the same time, we also need to look at that if there are certain uh, availability of a, our knowledge, how we can use that knowledge to minimize uh, this kind of uh, damage. That also can be seen. Like many areas now in uh, land, uh, there has to be a closer plan. That means after the you mine, you try to bring back the what ecosystem it had earlier. And there are uh, many people have shown that you can bring it back. Uh, the one experiment was done by Professor Babu in Delhi. He brought back, before the invasion of a prosopis, he brought back the ecosystem back, how the it can be. So if we use our knowledge to uh, utilize the resource and also minimize the damage. And after the mining is over, whether we can bring it back to the origin. I mean, it won't come exactly original, but 
nearer to that whether we can bring it. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is by asking why fresh water generation from seawater is not on a large scale and power from thermal gradient of seawater is not exploited again on a large scale? Uh, the question is why we are not doing on a large scale. Yeah, exactly. the, there is a one problem, you know, when you need a, a cool water in a short distance, like on a coast, if you have to go to 800 meter or so, you have to go kilometers together. In Luxury Island, this is very easy because you get uh, 800 meter uh, depth uh, within 100 uh, or uh, 1.52 kilometers. So the pipe which you have to lay down is not very long. If you lay down 40 kilometer of pipe, the pumping and all that will be large amount of energy. So it doesn't work. So what we are planning is that you create a platform into the sea where such depths are available and then transfer the water, uh, which is very simple because the fresh water will be always float on a saline water. So you have to just have some simple uh, uh, plastic containers, which could be huge, just store them. So transferring water is not a problem. But that platform, now the problem is with that platform. The, in the sea, what happens is there is a continuous wave action so when you have a huge pipe, when you have to draw large amount of water, the pipe the diameter could be very large. And that connecting with the platform, uh, that we are finding a lot of issues. So there are a lot of experiments are going on how to solve that problem. And uh, I'm sure that once we have a handle, you can create a platform and uh, make a fresh water. Or you can try to do it on some of the platforms which we have on the uh, sea, which is of course not very deep as of now. It is 80 meter, 100 meter. But those who are uh, around uh, more than 500 meter or so, we can definitely do this kind of an experiment. I think it is a large investment would be there, about 2,000 crore or so. But I think it is worth doing that investment to see whether we can make fresh water from the sea in the same way like we get a water in the monsoon. You know, this process, what we are using is mimicking the monsoon. So this is the best way of getting the fresh water. So we may have to do a little bit more work on that, but I'm sure in coming years, we should be able to solve this problem. Okay, thank you. Uh, next question is by Professor Hariom Vats. He's asking, what are the main sources of microplastic and what is being done in this direction? It's mainly the uh, litter. I mean, many of us uh, initially thinking it is plastic bottles, these, that, etc., which we are throwing all. Over. But also recent study, it is the uh, fabric, which is the, provides most of the microplastics. Uh, because synthetic fabric use also has drastically increased, and that is what uh, is one major source. And uh, of course, the uh, plastic bottles, many plastic things, uh, all which is not properly disposed of and just thrown, they ultimately find their way to the ocean. And uh, the largest uh, plastic is coming from US. And uh, uh, second is China. India is much, much less, though our managing the uh, solid waste is very bad, but our usage of plastic is much lower than what US is using. Okay, thank you. So now I have the last question by Kapil Bharadwaj. He is asking, the warming of ocean water and rise in sea level are adversely not only killing the corals, also adding to the climate change. If it continues at the present rate, it might be fatal to oceanic ecosystem. Do you think corals will be able to evolve enough to counter this adversity? 
No, I I personally don't agree that the with the rising sea and warming the corals will die. You know, even in partial gulf, the corals are surviving at thirty six degrees centigrade, and they have survived all these four hundred and fifty million years. And we had uh, very high carbon dioxide, high temperature, everything they have gone through. It's not that this is the first time happening. So I don't think it will die or completely vanished. It may give way to a much harder and more resilient species. And we have seen that, especially in Necropora, that the once the area where it has been uh, bleached, next time that region doesn't get bleached, though the temperature is same. So they have a higher resilient to that high temperature. Also, there is a need to have a, we need to understand that what exactly is happening. Uh, many believe that it is not coral actually dying because of the high temperature. It is the algae is dying. And since there is a symbiotic relationship, since there is no food, the coral also dies. Now, uh, somebody has to do that experiment and understand what exactly is happening. What we are able to do is some observations, but I don't think we have a clear answer to that. And where the corals are surviving, whether it is algae which is surviving, so that's why coral is surviving. So whether algae is becoming resilient to higher temperature. So that question is not properly answered uh, in my view. <clears throat> Somebody may have better information on this. But I think we need to answer that because nobody says that algae has died. Everybody says coral has died. But if it doesn't have a food, how coral can survive? So, and bleaching essentially means coral dying, not uh, algae dying, not the coral dying. The color is because of the algae. So, these are the questions I think we need to answer uh, if we want to know whether what would be the fate of coral reefs after, say, 50 years or 100 years or whatever. Okay, thank you, Dr. Naik. So there is, I want to share that there is one obituary of the Great Barrier Reef has been already written in New York Times in 2016. Of course, that was a very long stretch. Uh, yeah. But yeah, I know that. But, you know, the, the, the issue is the weather there is where it has happened. See, last uh, 30 years, we have several episodes of bleaching. But uh, I didn't find a single place they said that the same area is breached again. You know, they, there are always a different areas. They say that the coral is bleached. And the relationship with algae is still not well understood. So I don't buy that argument that... Uh, of course, there would be temporarily, there would be damage uh, like uh, tsunami. We have seen the corals were extensively damaged. And uh, two years back when I went to same places, the corals have regenerated. It took almost uh, 10, 12 years, but it has regenerated. Same places. So, and the, the experiments to broke corals are also quite successful. A lot of experiments have been done. And uh, if something has happened, we can also try to grow them in lab and then transplant it. So there are, there will be technological solutions to all such things. I don't think uh, that, uh, because if they had survived 450 million years, it will survive 100 years, definitely. I don't think I have any doubt in that. Sure, sure. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you for patiently answering all the questions with uh, great detail. We learned quite a lot and it was a pleasant duty to conduct this particular session. Now I would like to hand over the screen to my colleague, Dr. Vineet Goswami. Uh, Vineet. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Arvind. So, mm -hmm. That brings us to the conclusion of the 58th episode of PRL Kamrit Vyakhya. So uh, first I would like to thank uh, Dr. Sandesh Naik 
for accepting our invitation and giving an excellent talk on overview of the economics of the ocean and sustainable utilization of the ocean resources. At the same time, stressing on the health of the oceans in, in our PRL Cambri Vyakhyan Forum. And it is always so delightful to listen to his talks. And also, thank you very much for answering all of our audience's questions so nicely. Uh, next, I would like to uh, thank uh, all of our audiences on both WebEx and YouTube platforms. Uh, I express my sincere thanks to Director PRL, Professor Anil Bhagwaj, Dean PRL, Professor D. Pallam Raju, and Professor Nandita Shirvastava, uh, Chair of the PRL Kamrit Vyakhyan Committee, for all their support in organizing this Vyakhyan successfully. Uh, I also thank my colleagues in Vyakhyan Organizing Committee for successfully conducting the 58th episode of PRL Kamrit Vyakhyan series. And uh, finally, I sincerely thank you all for being part of the Azadi Kamrit Mahotsav and PRL at 75 celebrations. Uh, with these words, I propose for the closure of today's episode of PRL Kamrit Vyakhyan. And to see you next time in, in the next episode of the PRL Kamrit Vyakhyan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.